Okay. Glory to God. Oh, we're going to be doing a couple of sermons on the Advent to Christmas. But you know something? I'm not going to be looking at the Advent in the same way as we've always have. I'm, you know something? As a minister, as a pastor, and somebody who speaks regularly, you're always looking for something in there. And you're always praying, God, open something up. And I believe God did open something up. Very special for today. Um, there's not a whole lot of scriptures, but it's rich. The scripture that we have today is absolutely rich rich. It is rich in wisdom and grace. Amen. And um, what we want to do is we want to open up to John chapter 15 verse 11. I'll put it up and I'll put it up on the screen for you. Amen. And um, we look at the season of Advent and we look at the season of Christmas and the one word that blares out at you is a word called joy. But what happens is a lot of times we misinterpret it and misunderstand what is it about this joy. How can this joy bring us through situations that we're going through, seasons that we're going through? And we're going to be looking at that today. Amen? So let's read this scripture and then we're going to pray. John chapter 15 verse 11 says, I have told you this. So that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask in the precious name of Jesus that you would give us a wisdom and a grace and a capability to receive your word, to hear it, Lord God. Let it get into our very spirits, into our very conscience, into our very inner man. Let it go and let it germinate in there and bring forth fruitfulness. Help us to be able to see, give us perspective and understanding in every circumstance and situation as a result of this word that you give. So we ask, Lord God, as we open our hearts up to you, that you would speak to us this day in a special way. In Jesus' name. Interesting thing about this passage of scripture, the Bible says as long as you have your joy, listen to the principle, as long as you have your joy, you do not have enough joy. Let me say that again. As long as you have your joy, you do not have enough joy. Why? Because your joy will never be enough. So I need to give you my joy. This is what God's saying. I need to give you my joy, which comes to you from a different source. See, we used to sing a song in Times Square Church. In fact, I think Louise even brought it up today, this morning. She didn't even know I had it in here. Remember, there's an old song, if you remember the old Pentecostal song. This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Amen. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about, our, 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 the word for today is, and the title of this message is, Convincing yourself. Convincing yourself. This is extremely important, I think, in the time and season that we're in. Because not only are, when in this scripture that I'm talking about, Jesus was leaving, but Jesus was doing something very special in his passive scripture. He was preparing them for him to return. And he was equipping them that while he's gone, to strengthen them with joy. So we're going to hopefully be able to see that clearly today. So we're going to be talking about convincing yourself. And this is important. I was talking to a friend at work about investments. And I quoted the statement that I, that I forgot who said it. But the statement was, the most important investment you can make is an investment in yourself. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, you can invest in a lot of different things that will get you wealth, but the most important investment that you can make in this lifetime is the investment you make in yourself. Your willingness to invest in yourself in the present is an indication that you believe about your future. So if you don't invest in yourself now, you don't believe that your future will be bright or strong. It's important for us to invest now in order to believe for the future. And this is not about money. I'm not talking about money today. See, if you really believe it's going to rain, you build an ark. Or you bring an umbrella in today's world. Mm -hmm. If you really believe that God's getting ready to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think, you'll actually get ready for it. You'll make a way for it. You'll prepare for it. If, something, if you believe something is going to happen, belief will always bring you to a place of action. Always. If you're a business owner and you really believe business has come from the north, south, east, and west, that you're going to have, you're not going to have enough room to receive it, the clients and the contracts and the opportunities or whatever it is, then what you do is you get ready for it. You prepare yourself for growth. And what happens is so many people don't, don't prepare themselves for the growth. And when the opportunities do occur, we spur it. I was listening to a podcast the other day. I don't know if it was Cal Newport or someone like that, but there was something that was said that shocked me. It was so simplistic, but what shocked me was the reality of the statement. He's right. He said there's only one reason why people do something or don't do something. Ready for the profanity of this? It's so profound. I, should say, I shouldn't say profanity, but it's so profound. There's only one reason why people do something or don't do something. The reason was because they feel like it. The only reason why people do something or don't do something is because they feel like it. It's an amazing thing. He said when they do it, it's because they feel like it. When they don't do it, it's because they don't feel like it. So profound and so simple, but I never thought about it. The power that's there. And as I began to explore this concept, I thought that this has some consistency with the convictions that I have from Scripture. When I look at the activity of the individuals that are examples for us, that we need to emulate in the Word of God. In some ways, learning what to do, in other ways, learning what not to do. I see there's a lot of activities that these people engage in. Why? Because they felt like it. And it's the same with us. We're no different. Sometimes we read Scripture and we think, no, oh, that's them, that's so different. No, it's not. Listen, Moses hit the rock instead of speaking the rock because he felt like it. Peter denied Jesus three times because he didn't feel like dealing with the persecution that will come as a result of being identified with Christ. Judas betrayed Jesus because he felt like it. He felt like it was going to be an opportunity to catapult his influence. He felt like it. And the podcast was not suggesting that we can't have dominion over our feelings. Or that we don't do things that we feel like or don't feel like doing. Watch this. He simply is suggesting that although it's God's intention that feelings be indicators, they're often dictators that are driving people's decisions. It's not an indicator. You see, we misplace our emotions. We misplace our moods. That's what's happening. And what he's saying is feelings aren't only a factor, but more times than not, they're the dominant factor that's contributing to the decisions that people make and the words that people speak. How many times do you say something just because you feel like saying something out of a mood or an emotion that you say that you're sorry about later? I wasn't thinking about it. What were you thinking about? You were concentrating on the mood that you were in. I'm upset, so I spoke upset. I'm sad, so I spoke sad. I feel hopeless, so I spoke hopeless. And believe me, this is one of the reasons the enemy is obsessed with the emotional realm. Because he understands the impact of the emotions have on our trajectory, that's what we become, and our advancement, that's how far we go. So the enemy is looking to thwart those two things. And I believe this is one of the reasons why it's so important 
And that's what most people miss out on concerning spiritual warfare and understanding what's happening in the spiritual. See, they don't realize that the enemy operates in the dark. And this is, there's something to this. Follow along if I'm clear enough. The enemy operates in the dark, which means that he tries to destroy you in ways that you don't feel like you're being destroyed. It doesn't feel like destruction. It might feel pleasurable. It might feel good. And it might get your mind off what's happening in the season. It's like an undertow. We talk about the undertow. You don't realize how far away you're going from safety and from where you need to be. He's called the prince of darkness because his names reveal his nature. The adjective that the Bible used to describe him reveals his activity. And so the prince of darkness, he's called because he loves the dark. How profound, Pastor. He loves the dark. See, dark is not just a metaphor for evil. Let me open your eyes to this. It's not just evil. It's a metaphor for ignorance also. He don't want you to be cognizant of what's happening. He doesn't want you to have lucidity concerning what's happening around you and what you're engaging in. So when that's when it's said that you're in the dark, it just it, it means that you don't know. And he likes to work in areas that you don't see him working in. So you don't come against him. And you don't go and try to realize, oh hold on one second, let me stop because this could be destructive to me. He likes to work in areas you don't see him. He wants you to destroy it. He wants you to destroy him in ways you don't know he's destroying you in. So he wants us to major on the minors while he's majoring on the majors. That's what the enemy's trying to do. He says you have no idea that this thing over here is actually something that I'm using to disrupt, to detour, and also to destroy your life. That's why he doesn't mind if you come to church on Sundays. Don't get me wrong, listen to me carefully. The enemy doesn't always mind if you come to church on Sundays. And I'll prove this to you. But he hates when you get into the Word. Mm -hmm. Because you could come into church and you could hear something and it could become entertainment and rote and repeat and something you just do to just do it. It's something to just do for an hour or two hours. He don't mind that. Because as soon as you leave, you're going to be leaving the same way because you're not receiving anything in your heart. But oh dear God, when you open up that word, he hates it. When you go and say, hmm, I took notes of what pastor was talking about. I want to see, is that true? Let me go in the word myself. And guess what? God will speak to you. You pray God will speak to you when you open up and you get into the word. So now why does the enemy hate it? <laughs> Let me tell you. He hates it because the Bible says the words of light and darkness and light can't coexist. David said, Thy words are a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When the word comes, it shows me stuff that I've never seen before. It sheds light on things that I didn't pay attention to before. It gives me insight that I didn't have before. Let me ask, is there anybody in this place honest enough to recognize that God knows how to turn the light on? Yes. You can only know that when you get into the word of God yourself, when you start reading when you start reading the Word of God. Because he can, shine, he can shine a light on dark areas in your life. Especially when you're not privy to it. See, so the enemy likes to work in the dark. And I believe he does a lot of dark work in the emotional realm. Mm -hmm. He wants to get in the emotions because he gets... If he gets in the emotions, he can impact your advancement. He can, he can make you desire to stop. Now we talked about this even with money and we talked about this with Adam and Eve. Where the enemy can't necessarily destroy you but what he can do is he can put you into a place where you destroy yourself. He can convince you of destroying yourself. He can convince you of walking away and turning the back on the lover of your soul. As a church when this happens, we need to declare that he, I can't, he can't have my soul. He can't have my future. And if you let him have your future, what's happening to you, and listen to me carefully on this, when you let him have your future, you're making the pain in your past pointless. Because what happens is 
when God has our future, we start to assess our lives. We start to meditate and bring to God our lives. We start to meditate on what He's doing in our lives. And He prepares us for the future and He gives us lessons that we can grow wiser in. But if we allow the enemy to rob our future, what's happening is you're making the pain in your past pointless. It means that all the pain you went through in the past is for nothing if you stop here. It means you cried for nothing. It means that you got betrayed for nothing. It means that you suffered loss for nothing. It means that you went through heartache for nothing. How many are willing to declare that your aggravation has to turn into compensation? If I'm going to be aggravated, I need to be compensated. I am not going to allow the garbage and the things that the enemy tried to throw out in the back to, to, to make me just a bitter old man. Or bitter, bitter old woman for you. Some of you are here. No, 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 no. Nobody's old. Bitter. Bitter. Young women here. Amen. I'm getting the, I'm getting the, hip, the hands to the hip slope. God help me. God help me. All this pain has to pay me. It has to pay me in wisdom. It has to pay me in strength. It has to pay me in skill. It has to pay me in opportunity. This aggravation has to turn into compensation. And in Psalm chapter 126 verse 5, this is something my wife many times has quoted to me and spoken over my life. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. But the enemy likes to work in the dark. He work in areas that seem minute, minor and minuscule. But they have a major impact. And one of the ways he does this is by engaging us in an area which we often overlook. And that's the area of our moods. How many know the moods that you're in can determine how you respond and react in the circumstances? If you're in a good mood, something bad can happen to you. But because you're in a good mood, your attitude is good. And because your attitude is good, you're more forgiving and you'll be able to see and respond properly. But when you're in a jacked up mood, oh dear God, let somebody look at you the wrong way and all of a sudden there are words that can come out of your lips that are unsavory. Okay? Amen. So the enemy majors in our moods. He's after our moods, and our moods are important. He's working in the dark, so you don't even know he's working. And the foundation text that we've read in John chapter 15 provides insight into this principle. In John 15, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples about fruitfulness, and he's using this agricultural terminology saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. My father is the husbandman. Except you abide in me. He's using his metaphors to try to get across to his disciples the imperative nature of intimacy more so than activity. Intimacy is more important than activity. That's what he's teaching in this. That's what he's teaching in this. Intimacy leads to activity. But, in, but activity doesn't indicate Intimacy. In other words, he's saying, I know you're used to doing stuff. And you're ready to do the work. But I want you to know that your effectiveness in your activity, the qualitative difference in your going to make in people's lives is going to be tied to your intimacy. I hope you heard that very clearly. I want to say that again. If you're going to have an effect on other people's lives, the ability to do that is tied in with your intimacy with Christ. If you do not have intimacy with Christ, you will not be effective in ministering to other people concerning the kingdom of God. You can affect other people's lives, but not in a way that has eternal value to it. I just want you to know that your effectiveness and your activity is according to your intimacy. He's saying your relationship with me is going to determine how useful you are for me. In plain language. If you're intimate with Christ, 
you're going to be effective in your ministry. You don't have to be goaded on your ministry. If you're not intimate with Christ, you're not going to want to do anything. You're going to sit down with your arms crossed. You're going to sit down and it's nice, some nice principles and nice things and everything. I might be able to get something from, from my life for me to use on myself or the people I like. But it's not the heart of God. Because the heart of God goes beyond you. It goes beyond your desires. It goes beyond your comfort. And you can't have the heart of God if you're not intimate with God. It's like knowing somebody. You can like somebody from a distance or even have infatuation with somebody from a distance. You can know a little something about them, but you can't know the deep things that makes them them unless there's intimacy in relationship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So, you know, I want you to think about it this way. I'm going to give a metaphor here. How many know that a tree can be big and barren at the same time? Oh, yeah. We see them all the time. And we're in, near our home, we have these old hundred-year-old trees that don't grow leaves. The tree is big, but it's barren. There's no fruit on it. It's not useful. It's big, though, ultimately. So when I talk about effectiveness, I'm not talking about people, how many people we reach. I'm not talking about masses of people we reach. Because we can be wide in our reach and shallow in our impact. And there are many churches that have that, and we see that in the, in the evidence that's in the fruit. But when I talk about fruitfulness, I'm talking about the qualitative difference that is made in someone's life as a result of our activity. And so Jesus says to them, except you abide in me, he says. He didn't say attach. He said, except you abide in me. He said, abide. And when the enemy can't stop attachment, he comes after abiding. In other words, he can't stop us from starting. If he can't stop us from starting, he'll try to stop us from continuing. There's always an agenda that the enemy has against you. And where would we be in some areas if we've been stopped? Where would we be? He says this intimacy is going to be important. And the flow of thought is important here. Why? Because he moves from having intimacy, from speaking to them about having intimacy with him and the father to talking about his absence. This is where the flow of scripture comes. This is where it's important to understand the context. Why is Jesus saying what he's saying? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. He's saying what he's saying because he's preparing them for his absence. He's preparing them because he's getting ready to go. And what he's saying is, I'm getting ready to leave, and you're not going to be able to handle my absence without intimacy. You're not going to be able to handle my absence without intimacy. Because you've been dependent on me here bodily for, for three years. I've been here for you in the physical for three years, and I'm about to have, to, to have a different kind of presence in your life from what you're accustomed to. You see me physically. You see me here. But I'm going to be here, but I'm not going to be here the way you've always seen me and the way you've always, always known me. So he's about to change. He's about to go. And there are times when we experience a specific shift in our lives and it feels like we lost the presence of God. This is important because we're talking about moods. And when we talk about moods, this is, this is extremely important because if we feel like the presence of God is gone, we, sometimes that can have a particular effect on our lives. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. He may not be present in the way that he was, but he's still here. I'm here, but not in the form that you're used to. He's present when you have tears of joy. He's present when you have tears of sorrow. In all circumstances, he's still here. We don't see him physically, but he's here. So he starts off by saying, I told you this. What? He said in John chapter 14, this is what he said when he talked about, I told you this. What did he tell you? In 14, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. 
that where I am you may be also. See, so he's having a conversation with them in chapter 14, and he says the only way you're going to be able to make it in chapter 15 is if you receive these things and do what I'm telling you to do. Because chapter 14, what happens is they're disturbed by the things that they're hearing. Sometimes we have things that we experience in our lives that are disturbing to us. The have is questioning. The have is moving with inhibition. The have us confused about circumstances, about our relationship, about the character even of God or the direction which we're going in our lives. And we get confused because we have a certain thing in our mind and now all of a sudden something happens and it shifts everything to a place where we're confused about. So they were disturbed in what they were hearing. Then Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. Because I know that what I just told you about my absence changed how you feel. It affected you emotionally. It affected the way you see things. It affected your mood. It caused nervousness. It caused apprehension. It caused concern. So the way you can go forward, these words that I'm giving you, will give you the capability to process the truth beyond your emotions. In other words, he's bypassing our emotions to speak truth into our lives. So that we'll be able to see and have a perspective on the reality of what's happening beyond our mood. Because sometimes God has to suppress our mood in order for us to be able to see what's happening. And we see it all the time in, in the Psalms. All the time when David would start out, why is my soul disquiet every one of me? Why is everything happening like this to me? Why is my enemies always rising up against me? Why is it that I'm always at a disadvantage? Then all of a sudden, in the middle of the song, it happens where all of a sudden this shift, but now I remember God. What happened? This is what happened. His word got in him. His word ascended beyond his mood. Beyond his circumstance, beyond what he's able to see in the physical, God's word came through. It's starting to sprout something in his life that's beyond the emotions. So now, this is important. Sometimes the problem isn't the statement of the circumstance. Sometimes the problem is how you process it. How do you respond to it? What mood do you give or, or do you yield to or allow to have lordship, if you will, over your life? Jesus says, see, I'm leaving to prepare a place for you. Now, how that affects you isn't just determined by what I said, but it equally is determined by how you process it. And if you process it in a way that says, Jesus is gone, I'm by myself. i got to figure this out. I'm alone. We're going to be abandoned. That's going to produce one kind of mood. He said, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you fatherless. I'm not leaving you as orphans, the scripture says. I'm sending you another helper. I'm sending you a comforter. I'm sending you someone that empowered me to do what I'm doing. And when you commune with him, you're going to do great things because the scripture says greater things you will do. Greater things you will do. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. So leaving isn't the pain. It isn't the problem. It's how you process what is said. How you process what it is you've experienced. And whenever that happens, you tell yourself a story. And this happens to every one of us by nature. In psychology today, you can read it. On every circumstance, we tell ourselves a story in our mind. We don't realize we're doing it, but we do it. Think about it, and you'll see it, and you'll hear it almost in your mind. You're telling yourself a story. You're believing something about the circumstance. But you're believing something about the circumstance that you are telling yourself. You are convincing yourself based on the things that you're saying to yourself. And that is affecting your mood and how you respond and how you react. That is affecting your fruitfulness. 
So whenever an event happens, what you're doing is you're telling yourself a story, and the story you tell yourself is based on your interpretation of the event which is actually affects your mood. And this is why the Apostle Paul says to believers in Corinth, when the devil starts interpreting the facts for you, what that's called is vain imaginations. That's why we're to rebuke vain imaginations. That's why our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but, but spiritual. And many times we neglect the spiritual and we look at what's physical, and we start to respond in like manner. So now we look, we're looked at as carnal. We looked, and that caused us to fall. That caused us to go into sin. That caused us to respond in ways that is not pleasing to God and not honoring and glorifying to God. See, you're imagining something that's not based on truth and is provoking emotions in you that are unhealthy and unhelpful. So he says, I told you this so that I, my joy may be in you. That joy is important because have you ever had great news when you're in a horrible mood? Or all of a sudden you're in a horrible mood, you have mood, you have great news, and what does it do? It, it destroys the effect of the great news. You downplay it. You don't even realize you, you I didn't hear that. What? Your mood was overshadowing your mind and your heart and emotion. This is really important. See, I told you this that my joy, Jesus says, may be in you, and that your joy may be complete because your joy is incomplete right now you can have joy that's based on certain aspects that are happening in the world but the joy that God gives is all encompassing let me prove that to you see Jesus makes a decision a, a distinction between his joy and mine he says it's possible for humans to have joy that is different than the joy that I have to offer so there are different kinds of joy. He's trying to get them to understand the difference between his acceptance of them and their experience. And there is a big distinction. But many times we get the two twisted. You don't have to do anything for his acceptance. God cannot love you more or less than he loves you now. No matter what you do, that's established. Don't confuse my acceptance, with, uh, my acceptance with you with your experience with me. If you don't follow the instructions that I give you, you will have a spiritual experience. It will just be an inferior one. You're not going to experience me in a way that is fulfilling to you because why? You're not walking in accordance. You'll hear me talk about things that you'll never experience. Like peace, like joy, like love. Why am I not experiencing these things? Because you're not walking in obedience. You're not walking in truth. I still love you, but you can't process it properly. So now you go and you look for love in all the wrong places. So he says you have joy, but I want to give you mine. See, I see consistency here with what Jesus said about peace. You remember he said, peace I leave, I leave you. Not peace that the world gives. In other words, there's something I'm going to give you that's different than what the world calls peace down here. What you call peace down here only exists when everything is cool, when everything is wonderful, when everything is going your way. But he says, I'm going to give you peace that surpasses your understanding. He didn't say their understanding or anybody else's understanding. Your understanding. You're not even going to know and not even recognize how it is that you have peace in certain circumstances. How is it that the world is falling apart around you and it's not affecting your mood? All of a sudden, you're looking and you have hope. You're looking and you have strength. You're looking and all of a sudden, you know, the circumstances around you aren't determining your mood. They're not dictating to you how you respond or act. There's something else that is in control in your life. And it's not the circumstances or things that are happening around you. Because that's the joy of the world, and that's incomplete. He says, I'm going to give you a peace that surpasses understanding. And you won't even know. You won't know how, how everything's going to work out in your favor, but you do respond like it is. Don't worry, it's going to be okay, and it's not going to affect you. You ever know people like that? Sometimes it's annoying. <laughs> 
Because it's like, how can you be that way? Well, that's why you, why are you so peaceful? I don't know. That's because he gave you something that's qualitatively different than what people are settling for. And so when he says to me, my joy I give you, he says, I want to give you an internal state of jubilation that's based on a revelation that your welfare and well-being rests securely in my hands. It's a revelation that's given to you. It's a revelation that's keeping you. That no matter what's happening around you, the things that you're not seeing, the things happening around you, you're seeing the promise of God. You're in his hands and you're secure in his hands and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So weapons are going to be formed around you, but weapons can't prosper because God's got you in his hands. And when things are happening and stuff seems to hit the fan, you all of a sudden have a coolness of calmness. The world is shaking around you, but you're not shaking. Why? Because you're trusting in Jesus Christ. So as long as you're in my hands, you can have the joy that only comes from that revelation. That God's got this. So, come what may, you'll have joy in the world. That the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. He's giving you a dominant disposition that's joyous. Not that you're perfect, not that every day feels like your best day. But he says, or generally speaking, the mental place I want you to be in is one of joy. He gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory. So God is glorified by what? By my joy. It's a revelation. It's a reflection of who he is when we're joyful. If we're not joyful, we're not reflecting God. We're, we're a caricature of God. And that's not what God wants in our lives. Sometimes we just think that God's glorified by our acquisitions or by what we get or what we do or our accomplishments. But God is more so glorified by your emotions. When you see, in other words, he's like, when you see joy, that's me. When you see everything falling apart and they're not, that's me. I see that. When you see them dancing in the rain, that's me. <laughs> yeah. When you see Jessica riding that oh, unique no. bike, low rider, <laughs> smiling, going down, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else can do that, but God can. Hallelujah. So God is glorified through your holiness, but God is also glorified through your joy. And not many of us see that. That's what he's teaching us in this passage of scripture. <laughs> and Louisa still see the picture of the, the no rider. So why is this important? This is important because of what your mood affects. And there's one thing, and we're going to close. Your mood affects your purpose in ministry. Yes. Oh, it affects how you look at life and how you respond. Uh, your purpose, because that is what you're going towards. Your ministry is how you're responding on your way towards your purpose. Yep. And the fulfillment of your purpose. The enemy wants you to make vows in the middle of pain. I'm never going to trust again. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to make that mistake again. I'm never going to get somebody again. I'm never going to be around those kind of people again. I am never going to. He wants you to make those vows. That's what the devil's trying to do to you. Because if he can get you to do that, you're going to feel like you're obligated to stick to those vows. And even if a certain circumstance happens in your life where God opens up the right person to come into your life, you're not going to be willing to do it. Why? Because you set in your mind. You're cemented in your mind. That I'm never going to fall into that again. I'm never going to be vulnerable again. I'm never going to love like that again. So you're asking God for that person. When God brings you that one person or the place that's act, that actually is a safe place, your heart's been so hurt that you can't open it up. In a place where people or that person actually can be trusted with. Your heart, you're asking God to trust you with promotion. I want something good. I want something more. I want something higher. You're at, but what's happening is when you're asking God to trust you with promotion, listen to me on this. What you're actually saying is you're actually asking him to, tr to trust you with pain. Trust you with pain. Pain is very important in our lives. We have... <laughs> Ma just said, oh, well, I've got, got, but that must be very important because I got pains in my joints. She was just saying. 
I'm talking about a different kind of pain. He's not just looking to see if you can handle people properly or handle possessions properly. He's also looking to see if you can handle pain properly. In other words, can you be jolted and not become jaded? He's inviting you to get wiser, not harder. He doesn't want you to get harder. He says, because I want something in your life and I want to do something special in your life, I need more than your gifts. I need your heart. I need you to bring your heart into this. I need you to put your heart into what it is you're doing. Because the cross is purposeful, but the cross also makes you vulnerable. And I know it's risky, but I need you to bring your heart to this. And whenever I stand in this pulpit, I need to bring my heart. And God wants you to go back and get your heart because you're going to need it where I'm taking you. The people have, the people that I'm calling to heal in and through your life, they need to see your heart. They need to see your love. And here's the thing about it. But what, God, what happens if they hurt me? That's a legitimate claim. What do I do? Bottom line is God says, I'm not asking you to trust them. I'm asking you to trust me. Because when you trust me and you obey me, I'm going to give you a joy that's going to be able to carry you beyond any hurt, heartache, or pain that you have to go through. Will you stand? In this Advent season, where we're expecting Jesus to come, he gave us scriptures, and we talked about them before. We talked about the parable of the talents, where he came back, and the one person that didn't believe, perhaps, that he was coming back, so he buried his talent. How he, how he was responded, we need to go, and we need to take our talents and give it to God, and he will multiply our talents. But that happens through intimacy. See, I am the vine, you're the branches. And because I want intimacy with you, I will give you everything that you need and I will become responsible for your welfare and your well-being. It's in my hands. And that revelation is going to give you a joy that come what may, you're going to be able to stand through any storm. Jesus. And it, just before Christ comes, in Matthew 24, it says there's going to be a storm of all storms. Jesus. I'm not just talking about the storm from today. We're going to get like three inches of rain. And I know I was told, shh. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about the storm that's going to really happen in our lives. Jesus. If we don't have that joy, the storm's going to sweep us away. Amen? Let's pray. Father, there's so many things that we keep our minds and eyes focused on. We can lose, we can lose track. We can be taken away by the undertow of what happens in our lives. Circumstances that happen when the enemy is working in darkness and ignorance. God, give us light, Lord. Give us light through your word. Help us, Lord God, to be obedient and to be steadfast in reading the Bible. We may not even understand it, Lord, but we ask you to give us understanding that we may hear, Lord God, that this light may go and dispel darkness, that the schemes and the wiles of the enemies may be exposed as a result of your word. Holy Spirit, take control of our mind and heart that we'll be able to see beyond our present need in our present uh, moods that we're in. That we may be able to hear and see your truth and respond appropriately and walk in the joy that you give to us. Forgive us, Lord God, for putting other things in a place where you need to be in our lives. And we thank you for the strength and the hope and the grace that you give us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Fruit and junk food and fellowship in the back. Yeah, I started fruit this time. I didn't start with junk food. I don't want to hear that.